This is Dr. Vermilio. In this lecture, we'll discuss speech recognition and noise ability and the hearing and noise test, also known as the HINT. Uh, Dr. Charles Berlin in 2012 in an interview said, audiologists generally focus on audiograms because the audiogram has become the gold standard of hearing ability, but the real gold standard may actually be their speech and noise results. Speech recognition and noise ability has been investigated since the 1940s. Uh, it's the most common complaint among hearing aid users. Unfortunately, it is rarely evaluated in the audiology clinic, and it is rarely or minimally covered in basic audiology textbooks. Examples of speech recognition and noise tests include informal hearing and noise testing, speech and noise test, and then the formal test includes speech and noise test, or the spin, the words and noise test, or the win, quick speech and noise test, or the quick sin, the bench kowal and Bamford speech and noise test called the BKB SIN, uh, listening and spatialized noise sentences test called the listen S, and the hearing and noise test, uh, also known as the hint. Informal hearing and noise testing uh, has been conducted uh, for, for many, many decades. Uh, when I was a, a student working at the VA uh, Department of Audiology, in Long Beach, California, uh, many, many of my patients would say, especially the hearing aid patients, that they had great difficulty recognizing speech in noise. So I would fit them with the, the hearing aid, and then I'd, we didn't have a formalized uh, speech recognition and noise test at that time, and so I would take them into the cafeteria, this noisy cafeteria with all this great noise, and I'd ask them, okay, you know, can you understand, you know, uh, what I'm saying? Can, uh, is the hearing aid working for you okay? And uh, then I would take out a screwdriver, this is the old screwdriver days, and I would physically adjust the potentiometers on the hearing aid, adjust the low frequency response, adjust the gain, and uh, try to improve my patient's uh, speech recognition and noise ability with the hearing aid. It was not a formal test. There were certainly no norms for that. Uh, test reliability, I'm sure, is very poor. So. If if I did the same procedure from day to day, that would change because, you know, my speech wasn't calibrated. Um, but it did give me a, a basic idea of my patient's ability to recognize speech and noise. Now, speech and noise tests have a variety of uh, uh, sentences or words used. Uh, some tests have males talking, some have females talking. Some use uh, t 12 talker babble, so imagine uh, a small group of 12 people talking in the background while you're trying to listen to the target speech, or six talkers, four talkers, something called speech spectrum noise, and that's basically white noise filtered to have the same spectral shape as the, the speech of the talker. So it's a broadband noise, it sounds sort of like shh in the background. Uh, some, some speech recognition and noise tests use a fixed uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Some use an adaptive protocol. Uh, the vocabulary for some of the tests are appropriate for first graders and older. Uh, some tests are, are uh, only at a high school level. Uh, the, the scores for the test are either percent correct or the keywords are, are scored or the whole sentences are scored. Uh, the test results are reported in percent correct, or the signal to noise ratio for 50% uh, recognition of the words or the sentences. So, if you have a patient and they have a speech recognition and noise test result, um, you, you have to ask, okay, how was this obtained, and what were the norms, and how does this relate to the norms? And then, if you had a couple of tests from the same patient, could you make a comparison from test session to test session? Well, the answer is you can as long as the same protocols and the same uh, word lists, same method of delivery were used for each of the test sessions. If not, there is no way to make a direct test comparison.
Okay, now we'll discuss measuring speech recognition and noise ability using the hearing and noise test. The hearing and noise test, or the HINT, was developed at the House Research Institute under the, the direction of Dr. Siegfried Soli. Uh, Dr. Nielsen, Dr. Michael Nielsen, wrote the, the uh, paper uh, outlining the development of the hearing and noise test. Uh, that was published in 1994. And let's see, uh, this is 2013, and I took a look in Google Scholar, and I typed in uh, Nielsen hearing and noise test, found that paper, and that paper has actually been cited by close to uh, in, in close to 1,000 papers. So it's it's been widely cited uh, throughout the fields of uh, hearing, uh, probably speech pathology, uh, hearing aid development. Uh, cochlear implants, the bone anchored hearing aid, uh, etc. It's been widely cited. Uh, there was a follow up paper, a very short paper, uh, that I did uh, in 2008, and that was just simply to get the norms for the 20 sentence uh, list that are currently used in the HIT test. Uh, Dr. Nielsen used the 10 sentence list and, and did all the work in, in um, creating that, that uh, test with Dr. Sully and a, an audiologist by the name of Gene Sullivan. Uh, the hint has been produced in 14 plus languages uh, and it uses an adaptive protocol which means that the presentation level of the sentences will change based on the response of the patient. So if the patient understands the, the uh, or, or correctly repeats the sentence then the next sentence is, is decreased in level. If the patient does not correctly repeat the, the sentence, then the next sentence is uh, elevated in level. The hint threshold is the signal to noise ratio. This is for the hint test and noise. The signal to noise ratio where the patient correctly recognizes 50% of the tokens or sentences. And these are a bunch of the developers, Dr. Soli, who's a cognitive psychologist, Dr. Michael Nielsen, who's a cognitive psychologist, uh, and we have uh, Mr. Dan Freed, who's a genius software engineer, did most of the work on, on the, uh, the present commercial version of the Hint. Uh, myself, when I had hair, uh, Dr. Justin Aronoff, uh, who's a neuroscientist, did a lot of work with the what we call the Direct Connect Hint system using cochlear implants. And Dr. Yang Su Yoon has done a, a bunch of work with the Hint. He's a, a hearing scientist. Also, we've had a whole uh, large group of audiologists and uh, engineers, uh, electrical engineers and software engineers that have worked on the development of the hearing and noise test. The hearing and noise test is, is available in uh, at least 14 languages, and you can see this long list here. Uh, it was my pleasure to, to actually record all of the, the, these, uh, these languages, and uh, typically we bring on board uh, an actor or a voiceover actor or a radio personality who has a professional voice uh, and who speaks uh, whatever language we're trying to record and then they would record the material. We would uh, collaborate closely with our um, colleagues in the various countries. They would listen to the materials, critique the materials. Sometimes the materials would have to be uh, uh, re-recorded -re and then we would uh, we would record anywhere from 500 to 750 sentences in a particular language and it would take six months to a year to develop a new hint language. You can read about that process in the paper by uh, Dr. Michael Nielsen uh, from 1994. There are, there are three, what is it, it says three hint tests are currently under development. Well actually there's more than three. I think we have five uh, here so that's, that's a mistake. But anyway, uh, Hebrew, Italian, uh, New Zealand English, Hindi, and Russian. Uh, also, oh, I should have added one more. Uh, I recently recorded a version uh, in Polish, and we recorded one for the uh, U.S. Army. Uh, Stig Arlinger, 
Arlinger rather developed the Swedish hint that is compatible with the uh, the latest version of the uh, commercial version of the hint test. The hint evaluates the patient's ability to recognize sentences in the presence of background noise based on the Dutch speech recognition and noise test developed by Plomp and Mimpen. If you are familiar with the paper by Middleweird in 1990 where they looked at speech recognition and noise ability for two groups of patients, one group, or two groups of subjects rather, one group who reported no difficulty hearing speech and noise, the other group reported some difficulty uh, recognizing speech and noise. Both groups of subjects had normal audiograms. The, this test by Plomp and Mimpin was used in that study by Middleweird and it showed the test results showed that the, uh, the folks who said that they were struggling to hear speech and noise actually had a measurable speech recognition and noise uh, deficit. And there was a significant difference between scores, or rather between groups for the uh, speech recognition and noise test results. The noise used with the hint is a steady state uh, broadband noise with a spectral shape similar to the long-term average spectrum of the, the sentences. The hint threshold is reported in dBSNR. Actually, there are two hint thresholds. One for a quiet version of the test, so it, it sounds strange, but yes, we have a hearing and noise test done without noise, and then we also have the hearing and noise test done with noise. The hearing and noise test, uh, where there's no noise, the hint threshold is reported in dBA. But the hint test conducted in noise the hint threshold is reported in dB signal to noise ratio. Now what does that mean? A 10 dB signal to noise ratio means that the speech signal is 10 dB above the level of the noise. A minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio means that the speech signal is 10 dB below the level of the noise. So imagine if you were in a noisy restaurant, you're trying to hear this conversation, you're trying to hear the person in front of you, and imagine if that person's voice was 10 dB above the, the noise of the crowd in the restaurant. Now imagine that the same restaurant, but suddenly now the person you're speaking to, their voice is now uh, 10 dB below the noise. So that's a minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio. So which of these conditions would be easier to listen to? Would you rather have that person speaking 10 dB above the noise floor or 10 dB below the noise floor? Well, the answer is, of course, that you'd rather hear the voice at least 10 dB above the, the conversations around you. A minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio is just, just pretty much impossible to, to hear, especially if the person was right in front of you that you're trying to listen to. So the more negative the hint threshold, the better the performance. The more Commit this to memory. The more negative the hint threshold, the better the performance. So in dB signal to noise ratio, if a person went through the hint test, a minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio is preferable than a plus 10 dB signal to noise ratio. But then you might ask, well, wait a minute. I thought you said if I was in a restaurant and I'm listening to this person sitting across the table from me, I'd want to hear their voice 10 dB above the noise. That is true. But when we're talking about the hearing and noise test threshold, the more negative score means the better the performance. Okay, so in the real world, when you're trying to listen to somebody, you want a more positive signal to noise ratio. This more uh, positive signal to noise ratio may be achieved through uh, some types of hearing aids, especially with a directional microphone, or with something called a frequency modulation system. FM system that's designed to give you or give the listener a more positive signal to noise ratio but for when you're taking the hearing and noise test you want a more negative hearing and noise threshold so if if you met somebody and they told you oh I just took the hint test uh, and for this one condition my my hint threshold was minus 5 dB signal to noise ratio and then if your score was a minus 10, you could tell them a minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio. You could say, well, minus 5 is good, but mine's better because it's more negative. A minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio hint threshold is better than a minus 5. Okay? 
Uh, on the same token, if somebody said that their signal to noise ratio was a, mo a, a 10, a positive 10 dB signal to noise ratio for their threshold, that would be a poorer threshold than 5 dB SNR uh, threshold. Or a, you could say it this way a 5 dB signal to noise ratio threshold is better than a 10 dB signal to noise ratio. So the more negative, so as we're going towards the left side of this number line in front of us, uh, the better the score. And as we're going in the positive direction, that is, represents poorer performance. Okay? So a minus 10 represents uh, good performance. A 10 dB signal to noise ratio represents poor performance. The more negative the threshold, the better. The more positive the threshold, the worse. Okay, the hint is a binaural sound field test, which means this test was designed to be conducted in a room where there's sound field speakers. The headphone version of the test simulates the sound field environment using virtual audio technology with Keymar head-related transfer functions. And there are four hint conditions. So binaural sound field test means two ears are used to listen to the sound, and the headphone version of the test simulates the sound field uh, test environment using virtual audio technology. This is with something called Keymar, which is Knowles Electronics um, Mannequin for Auditory Research, head-related transfer functions. A head-related transfer function, all that means is that when sound comes from a speaker that's away from your head, the, 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 the spectrum of the, of the sound and the phase relationships of all the frequencies in the sound will change as it goes from the speaker to uh, the pinna and by the ear canal and you know by the eardrum. So if you could capture that information on how sound changes, you could actually create a digital filter. So imagine delivering a sound through this digital filter that mimics what the, the head does, the head shadow effect does, the ear canal resonance does, with the, how the phase relationships of the various frequency components change. If you could do that, you could uh, simulate a sound field environment. And if you've ever listened to a recording using head-related transfer functions, you would hear that the sound does not sound like it's coming from the earphones itself. It sounds like it's coming from outside the earphones. It's really a, a cool effect. Uh, and there are four hint conditions. So again, this is a sound field test. Imagine a person sitting in a booth, and there's a speaker one meter in front of them. And the speech signal is coming out from in front, or at zero degrees. That, that is for the hint quiet condition. So if you're just listening to speech, you, that, that is the hint in quiet condition. Now, if we add noise, that's called the hint noise front condition. And if we push the noise off to the right, to a speaker one meter away from the center of the head, to the right, that, uh, that's called delivering the noise from 90 degrees from the patient, and that's called the hint noise right condition. We also have the hint noise left condition. The speaker is one meter away uh, from, the, from the patient at a position called 270 degrees. From the from the patient, uh, there's also some. So what we do? Let me back up here. So we'll we'll collect the hint threshold for the quiet condition, that's in dBA. We'll collect the uh, the threshold for the noise front condition, that's in dB signal to noise ratio. Uh, we'll collect the hint threshold for the noise right condition, dB signal to noise ratio, and the hint uh, noise left condition. We'll collect the threshold. That's in dB signals to noise ratio. We can take these three uh, thresholds for noise front, noise right, noise left, uh, add them together, multiply the noise front uh, by two, divide the whole thing by four, and that gives us something called the hint composite score, which is roughly an average of the hint performance across the three noise condition, uh, conditions where the front noise front uh, condition is weighted just as much as both the noise right and noise left conditions. The, uh, okay, let's talk about the hint speech and noise materials for the test protocol. The hint masking noise 
Uh, again, the spectrum of the hint noise matches the long-term spectrum of the sentence material. This creates equivalent signal-to-noise ratios across all frequencies. So uh, this purple line is the target response. This uh, dashed green line is the speech spectrum noise. And, uh, or, or excuse me, that's the speech spectrum. So imagine uh, the person who's, who's uh, uh, re reciting the hint sentences. We're looking at the average spectrum of their speech. And you can see that most of the energy in the spectrum is in the lower frequencies. And that's because these are mostly the voiced sounds in speech, such as the vowels. And then the, the level for in the higher frequencies is lower, and that's representative of the uh, voiceless fricatives, for example, the S, F, S, H sounds. And again, this is more of the vowels. So you see more energy in the low, low uh, frequencies. So that is the speech. The next thing that we do is we create this target, and we say, you know what, we're going to put white noise through this filter that uh, is actually a reverse or an inverse filter of the speech spectrum. And we're going to take white noise, which would have a flat spectrum, so all the amplitudes across all the frequencies. X-axis here represents frequency. Y-axis uh, represents the, the magnitude or the level. And then we shape the noise to have the same spectrum as the speech. OK, so that's why we call it speech spectrum-shaped noise or speech-shaped noise. The sound field environment is used for unaided and aided comparisons. The hint threshold represents the level or signal-to-noise ratio for 50% intelligibility for sentences. Uh, the hint uses an adaptive protocol, again, based on the early work by uh, Dutch researchers Plomp and Mimpen in 1979. And we use a fixed versus an adaptive protocol. Excuse me. The hint uses an adaptive protocol. And just to explain, an adaptive protocol, again, will change the signal-to-noise ratio throughout the protocol based on the patient's response. It's similar to a pure tone threshold pr protocol. So when a patient says, yes, I just heard that pure tone during uh, administration of the pure tone threshold test, the next uh, beep sound that they hear, or the next pure tone that they hear, will be at a lower level. And then if they, and then during the next presentation, if they don't hear the tone, then the next presentation will be at a higher level. That's called an adaptive protocol. We're adaptively varying the level of the test sound. Uh, if the response is cor incorrect, the following signal-to-noise ratio will improve, meaning specifically that the level of the speech will increase. Uh, this is an adaptive protocol where the level of the speech changes and the level of the noise stays fixed. At least that's the standard protocol. If the response from the patient is incorrect or if they incorrectly, or excuse me, if they correctly repeat the, the uh, sentence, then the following signal-to-noise ratio will decrease. In this way, a wide range of hearing configurations may be accommodated. A fixed level protocol, meaning a fixed signal-to-noise ratio test may not be appropriate for a wide range of audiometric configurations since there is only one presentation level. For some patients, the test may be too difficult. That's called the floor effects of the test. For some patients, the test may be too easy. That's called a reflection of the ceiling effects of the test. For example, if both the aided and unaided scores, so imagine a person wants to buy hearing aids, and then they're asking the question, will these hearing aids help me hear better in a noisy environment? Well, we can take the patient, put him in a test booth, and test him with the hearing and noise test without the hearing aids, and then uh, determine the thresholds, and then put the hearing aids on the patient, conduct the hint test again, and uh, measure those thresholds, and then look at, look at a difference in the thresholds. If the thresholds become more negative with the hearing aids, then we could say that the hearing aids actually help the person hear uh, speech and noise. So, but in, in this example, if both the aided with the hearing aids and the unaided scores without the hearing aids are, equals 100% speech recognition and noise ability, or it, uh, 
it has the same score. What, excuse me, when we do a fixed level test, we, we don't record the score in uh, as a DBSNR. We don't record it. We're not recording a threshold. A fixed level test will have a score uh, as percent correct. So imagine the signal to noise ratio is fixed, and we're just asking, asking the question, how many of these words or how many of these sentences can our patient understand? And we'll measure that in percent correct. Okay, I think we're on, back on track now. So if both the aided test and the unaided test had a score in this fixed level test of 100% correct, did the hearing aids help? Well, on the surface we could say, well, no, the unaided score was 100%, the aided score was 100%, so the hearing aid didn't help. Well, the answer is actually the hearing aid actually might be helpful, might be beneficial for the patient, we just couldn't measure it because of the ceiling effects of the test. Uh, conversely, if both the aided and unaided scores were 0%, did the hearing aid help? And on the surface we could say, well, no, because there's no difference in the scores. But the answer might be, yes, actually the hearing aid did help, but we're experiencing the floor effects of the test. The floor effects and the ceiling effects of a test are a limitation in that it may obscure the, uh, the truth regarding the benefit of the hearing aid in this case. Okay, so when we obtain a hint threshold, this graph on the right represents a test run for the hearing uh, in quiet test. So imagine the sentences without the noise, and then the level of the speech uh, will go up and down based on the patient's response. Notice that the y-axis is the presentation level in DBA, and then on the x-axis we have the sentence number. There are only 20 sentences in each list. So there are 12 20 sentence lists of short, simple sentences. The step size for the first four sentences is 4 dB. The step size for the rest of the sentences is 2 dB. So what does that mean? Here's the first sentence. It's presented at 20 dB A. Uh, the patient did not hear, did not correctly repeat the sentence, so we're going to increase the level of the sentence by 4 dB. So instead of 20 dB, it's going to go up to uh, 24 dB. If the patient didn't hear it, then we increase the next sentence to 28 dB, and then it goes up. So this, uh, this line right here represents that the patient did not hear the first sentence. Now notice that we repeat only the first sentence until the, the subject correctly repeats the, uh, the sentence. Once we reach this level, which is a little more than 50 dBA, finally the patient repeated the sentence correctly. And then the next sentence is decreased in level by 4 dB. The following sentence, as you can see, is, it was not repeated correctly, and then, and then we have to increase the next sentence to uh, by 4 dB, they repeat it correctly, and then we go down. The first four sentences uh, are presented in a 4 dB step size. After the fourth sentence, we switch over to a 2 dB step size. So that's why you see these smaller steps. And the hint threshold is the average of the presentation levels from the, actually from the fifth sentence through the 21st sentence. Now wait a minute, we said that there's 20 sentences. Why, are there, why is there a 21st sentence here? Well, actually there, there are only 20 sentences, but in this case the person, our patient did not repeat the 20th uh, sentence correctly, and we know that if we had 21 sentences, we would uh, elevate that next sentence by 2 dB, so that's why we know what the signal to noise ratio would be for the 21st. So we're going to utilize that, even though there are only 20 sentences. So again, it's the average of basically the, the sentence presentation's levels from the fifth sentence through the 21st sentence. You take the mean, that is the hint threshold. The hint threshold then is these, the level where the patient recognizes 50% uh, of the sentences. So if we fix the sentence level, give him another test, and made it a fixed level test, and we presented him the sentences to the patient at a fixed level that's equal to the hint threshold in quiet, 
we would expect that patient to only recognize half of the sentences. Now, this is for the quiet condition, and uh, if this was with noise, then this would be in dB signal-to-noise ratio, and you would see a more positive signal-to-noise ratio here, a more negative signal-to-noise ratio, excuse me, you'd see a more positive signal-to-noise ratio here, a more negative signal-to-noise ratio here, and that signal-to-noise ratio would, would change with the patient's response. Again, we're, this is an adaptive protocol because we're adapting the level based on, on the, uh, the patient's responses. The presentation le le level is based on the previous response, just like we just explained. An incorrect, cur ugh, excuse me, an incorrect response uh, will cause the, the next sentence to be elevated in level. A correct response will cause the next sentence to be decreased in level. The reception threshold for sentences, the RTS, or the hint score, or the hint threshold, or the uh, SRT in noise, some people call it, uh, is computed for sentences 5 through 21. What is the unit of measure for the hint threshold score or RTS in quiet? What is the unit of measure? Right, it's dBA. And just to let you know, the hint materials are calibrated in dBA, not dBSPL, not uh, dBHL. What is the unit of measure of the hint uh, in noise threshold? Right, it's dB signal to noise ratio. And just so you know that the noise is reported in dBA, the level of the noise is reported in dBA, the level of the speech is reported in dBA, we subtract the, the two and we get the, the signal to noise ratio, dB signal to noise ratio. This is how we do it. We take the uh, level of the speech in dBA minus the level of the noise in dBA and that gives us the dB signal to noise ratio. So in this example, the noise is, is at 65 dBA. The speech is at 55 dBA. So what is this relationship in dBSNR? Now remember how we calculate this is it's the level of the speech minus the level, level of the noise. So what is 55 minus 65? Very good. It's minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio. Okay, express this relationship in dB signal to noise ratio. The noise is at 65, and just to let you know, the noise is actually fixed at 65 dBA in the standard hint protocol. What is the, and the level of the speech is 70, so express this relationship in dBSNR. Right, it's 5 dB signal to noise ratio. Okay, sound field norms may vary significantly across test sites based on the acoustical properties of the test environment. That's why we always tell the users of the system if they're going to, going to administer the hint test in a sound field environment, they need to collect their own test norms. So for example, in this uh, graph we show you a window off to the left. The speakers uh, are on the left and right side of the patient. The patient either faces this speaker or they, the patient faces this pe uh, speaker, depending on the, the hint condition. Uh, if the patient is facing the left speaker, that would be for the, uh, could be for the uh, quiet test, could be for the noise front test, and also for the noise right test. But if we wanted to do the noise left test, then we have to move the, the chair, face the patient towards this speaker on the right side, and then the noise would come from the left. So using two speakers, we can get those three, four hint conditions. Now this win window right here can be problematic. The window can reflect the noise. If the, if, uh, for the noise right test, the window can reflect the noise back towards the subject's left ear. Whereas the, the noise left test, where the noise is coming from here, the speech is coming from here, if there's no window and there's sound absorption treatment on the walls, you're not going to have that same reflection. Because of that, you could see asymmetrical norms in a test environment. Uh, that is okay, but you do need to collect your own norms. Now what if somebody comes in with a desk's 
a desk or another piece of furniture that can also change the sound field norms. So those are th factors that need to be controlled by the clinician. Here's a, uh, a screenshot from the last uh, commercial version of the hint, uh, and you see uh, that we're expressing the norms in percentiles. We're looking at the headphone uh, test version and the sound field test version. And again, the headphones use uh, uh, head-related transfer functions derived from this mannequin called Keymar uh, to simulate the sound field environment. And you see slight differences between uh, the headphone norms and the sound field norms. So you have to, you have to compare test results uh, based on the transducer. Was it conducted with a headphone test? Was it conducted in the sound field test? In sound field. Now notice the noise right and noise left norms are identical. So uh, let me back up a little bit. The fifth percentile is the limit by convention of normal uh, hearing and noise ability. So if a person had a noise right score of minus 7.96, that would indicate that uh, they are right at the bottom of the normal distribution for the norms. And then this is the top of the, dis the distribution. So if you scored at the fifth percentile, you, you, uh, you will have a score better than 5% of the, the uh, individuals that took this test who all have normal audiograms. If you score at the 95th percentile, that means you did better than 95% of the, of the norm sample. So that's a pretty good score. If you score above the 95th percentile, that means you scored above normal limits. That's, that's really fantastic. If you scored below the fifth percentile, that means you score, scored below normal limits. Now notice this. A, uh, the fifth percentile is minus 7.96 dB signal to noise ratio. This says S slash N. It's, that's equivalent to SNR. It's another way to say signal to noise ratio. So the, the fifth percentile is at minus 7.96 but the 95th percentile is minus 12.24. So notice that this minus 12.24 is a more negative score. That's a better score than this. This is a more positive score than this. Okay, so the more positive the score, the poorer. The more negative score, the better. In the quiet condition, uh, 10.5 is at the 95th percentile, and 20.7 is at the 5th percentile. The more negative the score, the better. The more positive the score, the poorer. And if somebody had a score of, in this case, of 22.7 dBA in quiet, we would say that score is below normal limits. If the score for the, the quiet score, excuse me, if the threshold for the quiet uh, condition was, say, 12 dBA, then we would say that's above normal limits. That's very good. If the score is right at the 50th percentile, we're going to call that average. If the score is above the 50th percentile, we're going to call that above average. If the score is below the 50th percentile, we're going to say that's below average. So you could be below average and within normal limits. You could be below average and below normal limits. You could be above average and within normal limits. You could be above average and above normal limits. All right? Okay. So uh, back to this noise right, noise left. Notice that these two scores are the same. Now look at this. Look at the noise right and noise left scores for the um, sound field condition. You see a slight difference here in the score. What do you think caused that slight difference? That's absolutely correct. It's the... Uh, the the test environment. So if there was a, a window or uh, a door or some other object and the, the sound field, the physical environment of the sound field was actually asymmetrical, you can actually get asymmetrical norms and that's, that's the answer. Okay, keep in mind uh, every 1 dB change in hint threshold represents roughly a 10% change in speech recognition ability according to Nielsen et al. And now you know the very basics of the hearing and noise test.